Well, good morning. Welcome back to the broadcast for Retirement Network. I'm Jeff Snyder. This is BRN AM for Friday, December 10th, 2021. And our top story today, the long-term impact of COVID on economic and financial security. Well, joining me now to discuss this and a lot more is Professor Michael Collins. He's the faculty director for the Center for Financial Security at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Michael, great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us on the program this morning. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's great to talk to you. And you and the team at the University of Wisconsin-Madison have done a great amount of research on the impact of COVID. And as we know, there's been a lot of impact from a wellness perspective, but there's also significant impact economically and financially. Are there specific groups that have been impacted more than others? Yeah, so my, my colleagues and I, we many of us did research back in 2008, 2009 during the Great Recession. And so we were, when this first started, we launched a research effort to try to track things like credit scores and, um, you know, debt management and all the things that we sort of saw many, many millions of people struggle with back in 2008, 2009. Um, and we, I mean, honestly, we fully expected to see similar kinds of problems, you know, creep up or we'd see, you know, foreclosures and credit cards uh, balances and, you know, all kinds of, of, of those debt problems that really got people into a lot of trouble. And we haven't. I mean, that's kind of the, the story is that things are not nearly as bad as we anticipated. Um, partly, I think, because, you know, we weren't able to spend a lot of money. You know, the, the pandemic sort of put the brakes on a lot of people's activities. Um, and in fact, a lot of people saved and caught up and um, it's not universally true. Obviously not everyone is better off, but you know, many people's finances, um, the pandemic provided them an opportunity to kind of catch up, take a pause and, and get on a more solid footing. Yeah, really good point there. And, and you know, we're always expecting the worst. And look, we had a, a horrific, and we still are in the midst of a horrific pandemic from a health perspective, but it seems like we've been able to reduce a lot of, or a lot of people was were able to reduce a lot of debt, and actually, we're now seeing debt actually creep up with holiday spending. Let's talk a little bit about the Great Resignation, and we hear that banded about a lot in the uh, media. People talking about people resigning and moving on, um, but a lot of mature workers maybe decided to hang hang things up, but they didn't necessarily hang things up completely. Maybe they went into a gig type of work. I want to get your sense for this great resignation, how it was tied to uh, you know, the, uh, the pandemic and what you kind of see as a potential for outcome. Yeah, it's, it's very true. I mean, obviously when the pandemic first hit, so in April of 2020, a lot of people were laid off, people in frontline jobs, and we saw you know, unemployment just spike. People were involuntarily uh, you know, not able to work. And that's still sort of percolating through, but you know, a lot of people now are back to work and you know, back to where they were. But it's a lot of economists are kind of struggling and, and scratching their heads because there's between three and four million people who used to be in the labor force who aren't now. You know, um, you know, and sort of where did they go? And you you hit the nail on the head. Is about more than half of them are older workers. So older we generally think of as like 55 plus or 60 plus. You know, generally at the tail end of their working career or approaching those retirement ages in the 60s. And um, what's also interesting is if we look at claims for things like social security, old age insurance, they're up, but not nearly you know, 4 million more claims. So there are people who have stopped working but are not necessarily claiming social security benefits. Um, and so honestly, we don't really know what's happening. Maybe they're what you said, which is they're going into gig work or part-time work. Maybe they're enjoying the fact that their stock market portfolios are rising and their home values are rising and they just don't feel the pressure to go back to work, but they might. And so, you know, we might see in two or three years, people going back into the workforce or doing more entrepreneurship or simply being a contractor and, you know, sort of doing that 1099 style uh, work instead of being a full-time employee. So we don't exactly know, but for sure, the majority of what we've seen in terms of people withdrawing from the workforce are these older, you know, so-called older workers. 
Michael, uh, just the follow up, is this a testament to did the 401k or the U.S. retirement system uh, have a good pandemic in the sense that it, it kind of the markets bounce back? Uh, although we're, we've had some recent volatility in the market, but we're always going to have some level of volatility. How has has the retirement system withstood uh, this uh, horrific event? Yeah, it depends who you ask, I guess. So if, if you're an older worker, if you're in your 50s and you've been using your 401k consistently, which not everyone has, but if you have, say you started putting in money in your 30s and so you have 20, 25 years of savings building up, you experienced some downside in the early two, 2010, you know, 2012, 13, but now you've had this nice run up. Yeah, I would say you're you're happy. You've put in, you're getting back way more than what you put in and um, the system's worked pretty, pretty well. Um, my, you know, my colleagues who are younger, who entered the workforce at the time of the Great Recession, they haven't had such an easy time of it that where, you know, their, their portfolio balances, maybe in the last year or two have come back a little bit. But for them, they're sort of scratching their heads about how well the, the 401k system works for them. So I think it depends. Obviously, the long run, which is what we should be thinking about, a lot of workers smoothing out all these ups and downs have done pretty well. And this pandemic's been important because while we did see some job losses, we saw stock market growth and equity growth and housing growth. We didn't have those de sharp declines that we saw back in 2008, which made that recession really difficult because asset values dropped at the same time that jobs disappeared. Yeah, really, really interesting analysis. And, and last question before we go to a commercial break, we talked about gig workers. Let's talk about the U.S. retirement system as it relates to gig workers. There's a lot of state run plans. We've got multiple or I guess pooled employer plans now that are part of the SECURE Act. But how do you, how do you see if more people are transitioning to gig work um, outside of the spending constraints, there's retirement saving constraints as well? Yeah, you know, and, and like I said, our, our 401k system works pretty well, but that's, there's a big asterisk by that. That's for people who are in, in, in a, working at an employer who has a payroll-based plan. Uh, and so as we see more and more workers who are outside of that, either they're, they work at maybe a small company that doesn't have any kind of plan or they're independent, they don't have those options. And this is where I think some of the reforms that we're starting to see, like you said, the pooled plans or other kinds of ideas that are out there are going to become more and more important. So whether it's a state provided plan or just making it easier for individuals to save on their own, it's going to be key. The main way that the system has worked is payroll based savings, meaning you know, it comes right out of your paycheck and you don't even think about it. It's automatic enrollment. It's all the things that we've done over the last 20 years to make these plans work better. Now we have to figure out a way to make sure that applies to people who are at either small companies that don't have a plan or can't afford a plan or our gig workers are on their own. And these state experiments, I think, are a great example of the kind of, you know, innovations that we need to see in this field. Yeah. And by all accounts, Michael, there's like 60 or 70 million people who were not covered. So it's going to be interesting to see. Michael, I need to take a very quick break. When we come back, we'll talk about the Social Security Trust Fund, managing debt, and a lot more. You're going to want to stay tuned right here on BRN AM. Imagine a new television network that will make you richer, healthier, and in control of your financial future. This network is for the policewoman in Nashville, Tennessee, the baker in Dubuque, Iowa, the teacher in Lexington, Kentucky. We want to make the idea of savings and retirement culturally relevant. But what do you see as a defining issue of the midterms? Especially for the smaller businesses. I mean, they are the lifeblood of the American economy. Featuring exclusive interviews, current affairs, and docu-series. 33 yeah. years old, you retired early. The philosophy is money only matters if it helps you live a life that you love. But you gotta start thinking about retirement as soon as you get in. The Broadcast Retirement Network will drive very high engagement with premium partnerships. So this isn't retirement and savings for your parents or grandparents. This is for all Americans. And we're gonna change the way you 
think about money. Welcome to the next frontier of retirement and savings. This is BRN, the Broadcast Retirement Network. Are you over 50? Would you like to get up to 33% more income in retirement? Then call now for this free book, Annuity Do's and Don'ts for Baby Boomers. This free book reveals little known secrets about annuity strategies that will help you make the right choices before buying an annuity. Call right now for your free book. And as a bonus, we'll also throw in a free annuity rate report, both absolutely free for calling Annuity General today. Call 800-504-8194. Welcome back. We're talking this morning to Professor Michael Collins of the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Michael, thanks so much for staying with us this morning. Happy to. I love talking retirement. I love talking about the the you know debt management, which we'll get to in a second. Let's talk about the impact to the Social Security Trust Fund. And I know you talked about the 4 million people who may have just hung it up, uh, but and they didn't claim Social Security. But from your perspective and the team team's perspective, how does the trust fund look in terms of shoring up its ability to pay benefits. Yeah, and the, you know the the pandemic as I said has been for a lot of people their their portfolios have done pretty well. They've shored up their emergency savings, they paid down some debt from the individual level. Many people have used this as an opportunity to cut their spending and sort of get on track and so that's all great. Um, I wish that could also be true of the social security system which is not true. So in fact the most recent actuary report that came out actually took a year off of when the fund is not going to be able to still pay out full benefits. So it went from, um, you know, basically 2034 to 2033, which is only a year, but, you know, that's a little over 10 years from now that benefits potentially might have to be cut for, for beneficiaries. So, and that isn't necessarily that because of COVID per se, or because of unemployment, it's just because of the demographics of the country the fact that we haven't had a lot of immigration, we haven't had a lot of births, we haven't had that sort of replenishment of the workforce. Um, and then the fact that there's more workers out of the workforce, that doesn't help either. So, um, you know, we're, we're in the same boat we were before the pandemic. It's just happening a little bit faster than it was before. And we'll talk about policy implications of what policymakers can do about retirement. And, and, and we'll, we'll probably talk about Social Security as well. Uh, let's talk about long-term debt management and and as you said in the first segment, I mean, people kind of used the pause to figure out what they were doing and they cut back on savings. Uh, how do things look going forward? And I've been reading lots of articles, Michael, about uh, buy now, pay later, uh, people running up their debt. Um, and maybe that's just part of the exuberance of, hey, we get to be out, we get to buy things for the holidays. But what's your perspective, yours and the team's perspective on long-term debt management? Yeah, and I've, I've sort of painted this fairly rosy picture, right, of, of how things went during the pandemic and people paying down debt and, you know, especially older people paying down debt, um, which, you know, older, older people generally do. Um, but that longer run, I think there are some reasons to be cautious. So one, during the pandemic, many lenders, in fact, almost all student loan lenders, many mortgage lenders, credit card lenders, they put in place these sort of forgiveness periods or these holidays from payments. At one point in time, there were about three trillion, two or three trillion dollars in loans that were sort of subject to these, these provisions. And so that's reeling back now. More and more people are getting back on their payment plans. But for example, student loans, many people have not paid a student loan payment in well over a year, year and a half, and they're going to have to start making those payments next year. So I think we're facing a bit of a test in the next six months or so as all these uh, loans that sort of had special terms and conditions now are going back to not only the regular payment pattern they had before, plus whatever payments were deferred from the prior period. So that's going to sort of, we kicked that can down the road and now we're going to have to start paying for that. So I think there is that. There's going to be the shock that some people have where they weren't paying $500 a month in a student loan and now they are. Um, and as you said, we're, we're seeing you know, a slight increase in things like consumer loans and credit card loans. Um, we've seen an obvious growth in mortgage loans. And that a lot of that's because people are either buying homes or remodeling homes or you know the home, the housing market has really um, kicked off. So um, longer run, I think we are going to see more and more rising debt. And you know whether those savings, those emergency savings accounts that people accumulated in the last two years last for another two years uh, is, is a big open question. Yeah. And oftentimes it's the lower income people that get buried and we, and we don't want those people to be get buried. So hopefully 
there are some things that policymakers can do. To that end, Michael, when you when you're talking to either local policymakers in, in Wisconsin or policymakers nationally, what are some of the things that you talk about in terms of resolution, policy ideas, regulatory ideas that people can think about implement that these legislators uh, can think about implementing to help the financial system and also the retirement system? Yeah, I, mean, I think the the innovations we're seeing at the state level with plans like the automatic IRA or the secure choice is what some states call them, where, you know, all employees or most employees of, you know, sort of larger than one or two person operation are required to offer some sort of plan to their employees. Those are really important. Um, you know, having, having the ability to save at work, it gives you, it, first of all, it gets you usually lower prices than you would have to do when you get on your own. Two, it just takes the the sort of the burden of finding a plan and enrolling and making these, deciding to make these deposits and savings, it just takes it off your plate and makes it easier. So I would say anything that states can do to facilitate retirement savings through the payroll, through work, through even gig work it is really, really important. And that can take a lot of different shapes and forms, but I think that's a place where, um, you know, policymakers on both sides of the aisle seem to have some, uh, some interest in that, that kind of space. Yeah, well, um, you know, otherwise, go, I think, you know, emergency savings is critical. And so anything that we can do from a policy perspective to help people have that cushion, that's like insurance, that's the shock absorber, the resilience that families need. So ways that we can support emergency savings, either through work or through other kinds of policies are really important. Yeah, I, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I, I completely agree. We need to get people thinking about the long term and all these steps actually help with thing like, things like the Social Security Trust Fund and take a huge burden off of people in the future. Michael, we're going to have to leave it there. There's so much to unpack. I'm sorry we didn't have any more time. Great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us. And we look forward to having you back on the program again very soon. I, I'd love to. Thanks so much. Thanks, Michael. Great to see you. Thanks for sharing your perspective. That wraps up this episode of BRNAM. Have a topic of interest, someone you think we should talk to, drop us a line. And don't forget, for all the information in retirement markets, technology, personal finance, so much more, all in one place, check out today's edition of our daily newsletter, The Morning Pulse. Want to see our latest content or search our archives? Check out our new streaming partners. There's over 100 of them, Amazon, Roku, and Samsung, just to name a few. We're back again tomorrow, this time for BRN Weekly. We'll have a very special guest, and then we'll take a look at some of our best segments for the week. Until then, I'm Jeff Snyder. Stay safe, keep on saving, and don't forget, row with the changes. Now is your opportunity to co-create content around any topic on the first lifestyle and wellness network. Reach a global audience through our platform and co-own exclusive branded content. All of our programs are available on demand and also as audio only podcasts so you can take us on the go. Broadcast Retirement Network, available anytime, anywhere, and on any device. Are you being audited? And do you owe the IRS $10,000 or more in back taxes? Is the IRS threatening to take more of your money? Don't fight the IRS alone. The Tax Doctor is here to help you negotiate your tax bill and reduce your stress. The IRS can freeze your assets and seize your bank accounts, but you can stop these IRS actions. The Tax Doctor will work with you using our years of experience to represent your case to help you get the best resolution under the IRS guidelines. Help is here to deal with the IRS to reduce your stress. We've handled thousands of cases, so we know what we're doing. If you owe $10,000 or more in back taxes, do not call the IRS alone. Call a Tax Doctor now for a tax emergency analysis. Call 800-224-6439.